Knocks it through. Mullen bursting into the box. Josh Mullen. Mullen's ball across. It's turned in. It's Pittman who's got it. Livingston leads. Now can they get the ball back in? O'Brien. The lead. And Livingston have the lead. Man, the score. The full-time whistle blows and David Hay celebrates and the Livingston fans join in exultation. Livingston had the lead against Rangers and they are certainly rising to a few occasions on their return to the top flight in Scotland. I'm delighted to welcome Livy manager Davey Martindale back on to talk. Livy, Davey, how are you doing? Hi, not bad, not bad. Um, obviously, we managed to qualify for the, the group section, so yeah, coming into Monday is quite a positive. A wee bit of confidence for the boys, we got there in the end. Um, so no, nah, no, nah, Monday's a good day. And did you manage to get some downtime over the summer? I know you guys were away in Spain with the, with the squad, but did you manage to get away yourself with the family? Yeah, we went away, me and my friend Georgia went away on holiday, but you don't really get a lot of downtime, if I'm honest, because you're constantly working emails, WhatsApps, phone calls, so I'll probably, on any given day, probably spend two, three hours a day working, watching players on Scout and start, Stats Bomb, so I'm always working. My, George is in the pool, my for sunbathing, and I'm sitting somewhere with a coffee. And the shade, that's kind of how it works. <laughs> I know you do like to keep yourself busy, Davey. So, I mean, we'll, we'll kick off by taking a look back at last season. Now, there was quite the turnover, both in the staff and, and the playing yeah. squad as well. That, along with a few injuries and COVID right at the start of the season, would it be fair to say it was a tough start to the campaign? A really tough start, to be honest. When you lose, you lost a lot of continuity in the coaching staff. And I don't think people out with actually appreciate how hard that is. It's... If you kind of relate it to your own working environment and maybe, let's say, you went to your working 90% of the staff's changed, you've got to then retrain, you've got to re-coach. So it's very, very similar for a footballing point of view as well. So that was difficult on its own, plus I think we'd reached a stage in the Premier League, to be honest. The first year we came up with the Championship squad and we kept a lot of continuity, we added bits and balls, but that squad got broke up the second year through for no, no other reason than purely financials. Everybody knew the wages were on and came and took our best players. So we kind of hit that three-year cycle last year, two, three-year cycle where I think we need a lot of fresh blood in the building. And we done that, we done that, which again was very, very difficult. I didn't envisage that I was going to lose my assistant manager. I didn't realise I was going to lose a goalie coach. So there was a lot in, I also was trying from conditioning coach and calling. Yeah. So we lost three key members of staff and then we brought Doogie in as a third coach. That was the first time ever since my tenure at Livingston. In any capacity, they would manage to get an extra coach in the building. And then we lost Doogie after about two, three months. <laughs> so it wasn't easy, to be honest. Kind of that reflected maybe in the start of the season. It was four points from the opening eight league games and we, we kind of scraped through in the League Cup as well. Yeah. Was, there, was there ever any concern in the building that we might get dragged into a bit of a scrap come the end of the no. season? No, and no, that's not being cocky. I, I kind of knew what we had in the building. We knew it was going to take time. Listen, there's always that element of doubt, whereas you think you might get it wrong one year or the odds go against you. Obviously, there's that, and I don't think probably they bought eight clubs out with the top, maybe four or five clubs, seven or eight clubs. I don't think any of us are that good that we've got the divine right just to stay in the Premier League. So obviously that can change, but I knew what we had in the building and I could see the momentum building with that on a weekly basis. The boys were gelling. So, no, nah, I was always confident, and I think I came out publicly and said that. So, no, nah, I was always quite confident. We would get to where we needed to be, and if you look at it, we were what? a minute away for securing top six, potentially European football on the same um, the same page as that. So we weren't a million miles away, to be fair. Yeah, and 
For me, things really started to kind of turn round. I think it was the back-to-back wins in October against St Johnston and Ross County away. Would you say that was a bit of a turning point in the season for the squad? I think it was an evolution for day one, for match day one, all the way through. It probably looked at as a turning point, but personally, it was at no point during the two games that I think all have turned the corner. I kind of, and I speak about this quite a bit, you deal with one game at a time. I try not to reflect on all what we've done in the previous two games because all you're really worried about is the next game and the fear of failure, and that's really what kicks you on at a club our size. You're going to lose more games of football than you win, but you're still that doesn't mean you're not going to have a successful season. So you you probably get deal, get used to dealing with a wee bit more adversity than positivity at times, if that makes sense. Yeah, and to be fair, that kind of kick-started certainly a few more positive results going into the winter break and then after that as well, which, as you mentioned, put us in contention. I think we were sitting fourth at one point as well. Was it difficult to try and keep the players' feet on the ground at that situation when all of a sudden the press are touting us for European football? Nah, I think we've got a good, honest bunch. And as I say, like, we don't get too carried away when lose or draw. Like when we were sitting bottom of the league, we were only getting carried away that we were in a, a relegation battle. I think we're in a relegation battle up to the final game of the season, to be honest. That's kind of our mindset. Albeit if you get top six, you probably finish that five games earlier. Yeah. So we don't really get too carried away on the positive aspect or the negative aspect. So not, no real. We try and deal with one game at a time, to be fair. In that run towards kind of that Motherwell game in particular, there was some questionable refereeing decisions that were made uh, in yeah. some games. How frustrating were some of those calls, Davey? And are you back in kind of VAR getting involved later in the campaign? Yeah, I can't wait for VAR to come in, albeit it's going to cost us personally, it's costing Livingston £80,000. Now, yeah. if you put that into perspective, that's £80,000 out of the budget, straight yeah. away. It's £80,000. Then you throw in inflation over the last three years, you're up at 20%. So when you look at that on our budget anyway, everybody's wages have went up 20% over the last few years, then you're getting hit with VAR and we're getting hit with 80, 80 grand. It's a, it goes on a percentage of where you finish. So we yeah. we finished seventh in the league and there's a set percentage for finish seventh in the league. So we paid that percentage of the VAR budget, which equated to 80 grand. But then if you flip that round and now, we get the penalty at St. Johnson, which is a clear no base penalty, yeah. right? You get that penalty, we score that pe- still got to convert the chance. Score that penalty, there's your point, there's Europe. If you want to actually go into a wee bit more detail, you, the player's not available for the next game for St. Johnson. He's probably getting two games. That probably has a massive impact on potentially Dundee. I don't yeah. know. I'm just, yeah. just showing you like the amount of detail. So I think it's imperative that we do bring VAR in. Personally, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think it. It'll be interesting to see how, obviously, we've seen it down south and there's been teething problems, so I'm sure that'll be the case for a little while. But if it means getting the right calls at the end of the day, then I'm pretty sure every manager would be in favour of it. I would say more of the right calls. I do still think there's going to be decisions, decisions that we don't agree with, decisions that we debate. But do you know what? We're going to get more right than we get wrong, or a lot more correct than what we have done in the past. And I think... The speed and the evolution of the game, I think it's needed because there's a amount of times I'm shouting at officials. You shouting watch... at officials, David? Nah, that's just, not you. Something, something. <laughs> and I go and watch it back after the game and I think, David, you're wrong. But in real time, I genuinely believe we've been disadvantaged. Yeah. <laughs> and I go and watch it back. So I think it's going to help everybody. I do. I think it's going to help everybody and it's needed. It's 100% needed. As I mentioned just previously, the team came agonisingly close to, to making it into the top six. It was that late equaliser against Motherwell at home. How difficult was that for both yourself and the and the players to take that? Because certainly a disappointing way to miss out. Probably one of out with Stranraer relegation. And I mean the Stranraer game down there because even after the game at home, I thought we were very, very unfortunate not to be in the tie the way the game went. A way yeah. goes. Bar that game, honestly, and maybe the cup final. I've never seen the players as low. It was, it was, it was a horrible, horrible feeling. And the players were, the players were in shock slightly. Yeah. They were in shock. I was looking for solutions, looking for answers. 
oh, blood's boiling, but then again, you've got to feel a wee bit of empathy for the players as well there because they put their heart and soul into that. And then when you look back at the goal that actually took us out of the top six, a squaff clearance for Adam Lewis leads to a corner. They get the first contact, they get the second contact, then the ball kicks, hits off the barn, hits Ricky Lamy in the face. So also, I think the manner in which you lost the game or lost yeah. the points in the game actually killed us a wee bit. It was deflating. So it was up to us going into the, the bottom six games trying to give the, the boys an objective. And they went and done that. Fair play to the boys. They went and done that. We finished seventh, gained more points than we've gained in previous seasons. So fair play to them. But that game, honestly, it was an overhang in that game. It horrible, horrible feeling after that game. You feel... You feel agonisingly close, but you also feel like you've let the supporters down, you've let the club down, you've let yourself down. So it was that. It was just it was a, a genuinely horrible feeling. Yeah, certainly was difficult as a, a fan. I, I never kind of envisaged missing out in the top six would be as as painful as that. But you know, because yeah. at the end of the day, I kind of preach it on the podcast, thought about tenth place and above as success at the football yeah, club in, in the top flight. So. But despite that setback, as you mentioned, we had a very strong end to the season. Three wins, two draws, six games unbeaten at the tail end of the season. Yeah. You must have been delighted with the attitude that the players showed in those last few games. No, I thought they played, honestly, I thought they performed tremendously well. I think we're well worth our points because I still get people saying to me today, oh, what about you, 49 points and Dungeon United finished on whatever it was, 45 points. But I'm a big advocate of this split. I think it works well. I had that going against me the year before when we were sitting on, I think we picked one point up in the the last yeah. five games of the season, but as teams below us, they picked more points up. But it just shows you how difficult being in the top six is, yeah. opposed to being in the bottom six. But fair play to the players, all we could really ask is I'm going to be the best of the rest. And they did. And they did, and that's all you can ask. Exactly. And there were a few milestones during those games as well for a few players, two players that, You've obviously worked with and know very well personally as well. Scott Pittman hit the Premiership record appearances for the club, plus his 300th appearance in the Broxburn Buffon. Gary Malley got his Premiership debut at the grand old age of 39. Knowing the guys so well, Davey, and for so long, you must have been absolutely delighted for both of them. I was delighted for wee pats, not so much for stretch, if I'm honest. <laughs> I was just absolutely gutted. I couldn't have retired them a couple of years earlier, to be honest. <laughs> but, uh, we managed to get him on the plate. I've been trying to retire the big man since we in the Premier League. First year, I say to him, right, I'm going to put you on at Motherwell. Liam Kelly, actually, cheesy started the game. Liam Kelly was on the be- uh, out the squad. But Liam knew what was going on. I said, I'm going to get you 15, 20 minutes. That's it, you're done. Away you go. I think we were, we were 2-0 down inside uh. 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to get slaughtered here. No <laughs> chance. And then I think it went 3-0 and we got it back to 3-2. Yeah. Right. We, could have, we could have scored too late on, I think. Yeah, aye, that's right. right. Then the next year, the next year, COVID hits. Yeah. Then the next year, we're playing St. Johnson for a European place. So I'm like, as, as previous previous four years, we couldn't do it. So I was delighted to get set some game time and retire them. But for wee pats, I think it was unbelievable. I had wee pats in here before I came to Livingston. He was in here two or three times on trial. We were telling everybody, take a chance. Came in in trial, never really got offered anything, never quite worked. And then I'd been in the building six months. And then I think it was when Mark got the job, took a wee bit more the board gave me a wee bit more rope to come and try and recruit players or look at players. And that's when I thought, right, I'm going to, I'm going to go and get wee pats. And he was actually working with Stretch. He worked at GJK. Right. With Stretch. My son worked there. Gary Brown, one of the club's directors, and now it's his company, and that's where wee pats was working. So managed to get a deal over the line. I think he's one of his first games for Livingston was the Petro Fat Cup final at St. Johnston. Yeah. Uh-huh. And the man goes and scores. And I can remember turning around just behind the dugout and his dad was here. And I think that's the first time I'd ever seen his dad. <laughs> I, I was never, about to say, he doesn't he strike uh, me as an emotional uh, type. <laughs> he's no. But um, we picked within, within four months, three months, something along the lines. He'd picked up a Retro Fat Cup winner's medal and he'd been digging holes with um, a drain at a civil engineering company previously, three months earlier and playing with Bones. Uh, it's, it's quite a remarkable story with Pitts and 
you know, he's, the fans absolutely adore him and hopefully he can get to a testimonial year. That would really cap it off for him, wouldn't it? No, 100%. I'm waiting to try and get this window out of the road then. I'm going to sit down with a couple of players that are out of contract in the summer, try and get them tied up. Because I think they're building something special at the club. I do. I think they're building something and we need, I need to keep continuity in the building. I need to do that. And Pitts is, Pitts is obviously one of the players that I want at the club. Do you know what I mean? I need to keep him at the club, but I'll wait till the window shuts and then we all know where we are. And I'll speak to V Pitts about trying to get him tied down into his testimonial. Yeah, you mentioned you might need to get a white van out to, to get him t- signing the deal a few months ago. Have you got I the van we, booked? We, <laughs> we Pitts these. I think the first two years we Pitts we see they never signed a contract. I signed it for him. <laughs> nah, I'll tell, I'll tell you God's honest truth. I never signed it for him. That'd be illegal. Um, <laughs> I brought it in. Showed me uh, it's 13 pages. Pat sign there, signed it. Pat sign there, signed it. Not <laughs> didn't even know what pages he was on or nothing. Didn't know anything, honestly. Pat's I'll give you a pay rise. Oh, cheers. Pop back out. Going back in a couple of years. Look, Pat's need to sign that. Gave him a wee bit more money. I know, God. Never, never looked at a contract. Never looked at a contract. Signed it and away he went. Gave, you a, pay rise. Gave you a pay rise, wee man. Oh, thanks very much. If only everyone, everyone was as easy to deal with. You know what? I went and bought him an agent. I went and bought him an agent. I said, look, I've got an agent who's I think suits you. Because there's certain agents suit certain players. And I put him in touch with an agent who I've got a really good relationship with. Um, but I knew who would look after Pats. Because yeah. it came that time in the Premier League where I thought, right, I need to stop doing this. I need to stop taking advantage of you, man. Um, I went and got my agent, and then a couple of weeks later, I'm sitting arguing with the agent because he's wanting this for Pats, and I'm to give him that. <laughs> but, nah, he needed one. He needed one because, he, he, as you know, he's a man of few words. But Aye, he's been it very incredible. much is. He's been incredible for this football club, like, absolutely incredible. And you use the word legend. It can be used a wee bit loosely sometimes, but see, for Pats, I genuinely think he's became a Livingston legend. And I can't wait to hopefully get him tied up soon and we can get his testimonial. Because you know what? I think I think it would actually attract a big crowd. I'd be a lot yeah. of people want to show show their um, respect for wee Pats. Probably his worst nightmare, though, a day dedicated oh. to him. <laughs> He'll sign a contract as long as he doesn't need to speak at his testimonial. <laughs> But we also got to see the stadium looking a bit fuller last season with the community tickets getting handed out, Davy. Certainly that's something a few fans have talked about over the years, but it must have been great for yourself and the players to see the ground looking a little bit fuller at times. It was brilliant. And see, to be fair, like we, you all hear social media, uh, we've always kind of done this, right? But we never had the resources to do it properly. It was like me and Cheryl in the building try to do everything at one point. Then we managed to get into Premier League and then Karen came on board, Derek came on board and various other individuals came on board then. It was a year into the Premier League I knew we were missing a skill set in the building. We managed to get Dave in. So it's probably something the club's always done but we just never had the resources to do it properly. And Dave coming in, I think he's been he's been absolutely brilliant. Eh? Yeah. Dale as well, to be fair. But he's been absolutely brilliant. We've managed to get Karen and the office staff in, Trisha, Cheryl still still in and around the place. So we've now got the resources to try and implement these kind of incentives for the community whereas before out with the Premier League. We never had the finances to do it properly, to be fair. Yeah. But it's been incredible. It's been a really I personally I think and I mean this in the nicest possible way. You could be losing two and all and the kids are still positive. Sometimes no got that toxic factor within the stadium that can sometimes play into the players' minds as well. Yeah. And I'm not saying fans should be happy when we're losing 2 0, <laughs> but as a difference in the environment, there's a difference in the atmosphere. The fan, the, the kids are still positive, still driving you on. And I've found it a, a really, really positive experience. Yeah, it's been it's been fantastic from a fan's perspective to see those seats looking a little bit fuller. But overall, how would you summarize last season? And were there any particular highlights for yourself during the campaign? Nah. Try to look at the highlights. It's always good when you win a last minute. Like the Celtic game turning turn a wee corner there slightly. Um, I don't think anybody would have felt we were picking three points up in that game. I've also deployed Andrew Shinney as a number nine. Really bullied into Shinney playing a number nine. Um, <laughs> he goes in and scores a left footed winner like brilliant. It's just it's like a Livingston story, isn't it? It's yeah. like a Livingston story. So 
that game sticks out because it was just an unbelievable feeling. The Ross County last minute winner. Yeah. Had the sucker punch in the other side of that when we went back up there. Right ah. there. But again, you're away from home, you're on their bus, you've travelled up, um, you're in the change room, you scored a last minute winner, you've picked three points up. It just makes that bus journey all, all that wee bit more special. Yeah. So games like that, to be fair, but I think this year we've performed very, very well in some big games, even the Looking back, 10 men done United. Yeah, yeah at very good performance. I, at, yeah. at the time, I thought Ben was a wee bit unlucky. Arguing me out, I actually got sent off that game. <laughs> um, I got it overturned right enough, but um, I thought at the time it was a wee bit unlucky. Looking back, it wasn't. It was a red card. Um, but I thought the boys dug very, very deep in that game and showed massive resilience to come away with a point. A few Hibs games, I thought we were very, very good after the first game at Easter Road. There was a couple of Hibs games. You always enjoy beating the bigger, or the so called, they are bigger clubs, let's be yeah. honest, but you always enjoy taking points off them. But I'd probably say the Dungeon United game and um, the Ross County last minute, last minute winner, because brings a wee bit of a special edge to the game, to be fair. Yeah, that, that was certainly my highlight of the season, as you say, that. That, that the trip that makes it it's kind of after a year when you've not been able to go to games that's what you go to football for all just right. that moment uh, as you say it was it made that journey all no, the sweeter didn't no, it no doubt the alcohol helped you <laughs> I think I was hung over from the night before actually yeah, if yeah. I remember correctly so. I wouldn't have been there <laughs> no chance I'm going to Ross County away if I had a hangover the night before <laughs> But moving on to, the, on to the new season, we've seen a few players come and go over the summer, as is the yeah. case most most summers. Firstly, the players that have moved on, were there some difficult decisions for you to make yeah. for some of the players that moved on? Yeah, like I had a, a man-to-man with wee Sibs, a man-to-man with Jack. I think wee Sibs never had the game time that he was hoping for last year, but that was that was through, I, I feel partly responsible with that as well. He got hit with COVID twice, Sibs, he's got bad asthma. And I, I generally had to throw him into a couple of games. And do you know what? I didn't help him. I yeah. didn't help him. So I feel a wee bit responsible for that one. Albeit Sibs has got to take a bit of responsibility as well. But Sibs was one of the ones we shook hands with a good conversation. I said, Sibs, you're one of the players that ask club that if you turn around right now and say, look, I want to go and try and get game time elsewhere. Do you know what? I, I would agree with you. I don't want to lose you. Yeah. I, I generally don't want to lose you. But how can I stop someone? going and wanting more game time elsewhere. Jack McMullen, very, very similar. Jack was brilliant for us. Absolutely brilliant for us. Great guy. Really got a lot of time for these two players. The Livingston players always have a special place with me because I see at my time at Livingston. Yeah. And Jack was another one. See, Jack, I don't want to lose you. But I know both players could go and earn more money elsewhere also. Yeah. And they can go and play every week. So... I've got a duty of care to Livingston, but I've also got a duty of player to the player as well. Do you know what I mean? I felt we'd got to that stage in my relationship where we just needed to be honest with one another. We need to be honest, and that's where it was. So that was difficult. That was difficult decisions, to be fair. And Keegan being another one, I know Keegan's situation was slightly different with the injuries that he's had over the last couple of years, but obviously his attachment to the club and what he's achieved with the club, that must have been a, a difficult one I- as well. It's difficult, but you've got to take emotion out of your decision. Like emotionally, Keegs should still be sitting at his football club. If I was to make a decision based on emotion, Keegs would still be at his football club. Keegs would be at his football club for another 10 years. <laughs> um, um, again, me and Keegs got a good relationship. We knew it was going to happen when we put him out in loan. We knew that was probably the last time we were going to see him in a Livingston jersey. That was probably the only disappointing aspect to that. We never, it came about very, very quickly and I couldn't give Keeks a send-off that I think Keeks deserved. Yeah. So that was the only disappointing aspect for me with Keeks. But I think we'd reach a stage, Keeks needs to look outside football now. He was at that age. I think he can go and earn good money part-time. He can go and set himself up for the next 10, 15, 20 years and some sort of career where Keeks is going to earn good money. So I think it was... It was pretty obvious that Keegs needed to go part time to start mapping out the rest of his future. Again, it was it was a difficult decision, but Keegs made it very easy because he was thinking along the same lines of myself. So, albeit it was a difficult decision, it was very very easy because Keegs played a big part in really really helping me make that decision. Also, yeah, well, I'm sure Livy fans will wish all three of those individuals oh. certainly the best of luck because they've been very good servants for the football club over their time, but. 
You've been busy in the transfer market as well. Six new arrivals, in, including our latest recruit, Shamal George, who's arrived for an undisclosed fee. Yeah, The fans have seen glimpses of most of the new faces, but what do you think the guys can offer the uh, season ahead? I think um, we lost... Like If you look at last season, who who did we lose that I wanted to keep? Alan Forrest? Probably yeah. not. I'm not. I don't mean that disrespectful to any of the boys that's left. Offered Alan a contract, keep, try to keep Alan at the club. So in my, my opinion, we were probably looking for a wide player that could come in and start the game for us, and obviously the skill set Dylan's has. So I think Dylan, over the course of the season, is going to prove a vital signing for us. I think he's going to be good. I think we needed to bring a wee bit more physicality into the centre mid position. I'd already started recruiting that. Obviously, Sean Kelly can play there, but I'd started that recruitment process before Sean had kind of had shoehorned Sean into being a number six. What used to frustrate me, and I'm digressing slightly, is big physical Livingston. Yeah. I had Nicky Devlin, two centre halves, and James Penrice. And I had a midfield three that by a country mile was the smallest in the league. <laughs> and then a front three, Odin Bailey, Bruce Anderson, and Alan Forrest. So I had six players in that part when it came to set plays. I was absolutely pulling my hair out. That's how I'm <laughs> born. But no, do you know what I mean? I needed to add a wee bit more physicality into the middle of the park. We lost Jack McMullen, who was very, very versatile for me, even yeah. to a certain degree. And I felt it was important that we brought in a right back to push Nicky Devlin, give him a bit of competition. But also, Jamie Brandon, someone I see can play two or three positions. So then we brought Philip Kanker in as well. So Philip's came in, he's a, a young boy who's played played a decent amount of football in the A-League, but as soon as yeah. he found out he wasn't going to sign a new contract, he came out of the team. But I've got high hopes and aspirations for uh, Philip as well. And then I think it's not been any secret that probably the one position since probably Liam Kelly... Liam yeah. Kelly went to QPRs, probably been a goalkeeper now. That's not to say we've not had good goalkeepers at the clubs we have, but unfortunately, they've not been our keepers. Yeah. So no matter how you look at it, it's always difficult. Every six months, you're, you're looking to maybe replace your goalie because the parent club's taking them back or their loan deal's running out and it's not getting renewed. So we managed to bring Ivan in late the, the January window to compete for Max. I think Max, Max on his days, a top, top goalkeeper. I think, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not telling anybody that you don't probably see yourselves. There needs to be a lot more consistency coming from that number one position. Yeah. In terms of every every game consistency, Max on his day can be a nine, but unfortunately Max on his day can also be a three and four. So yeah. we need a wee bit more consistency there. Ivan's still adapting to life in British football, Scottish football. He's under a wee bit of pressure with his family as well, to be fair. But I think we've crossed that final hurdle with Ivan and his family's arriving um, Sunday this week, to be fair. Right. Okay. Very difficult for Ivan. Just silly wee things that the fans probably don't understand. And to be fair, I didn't understand it until he explained it to me. Ivan's got a house back home and his family's back home, so he sends the majority of his wages back home. When Ivan signed the Livingston, he got 120 rubles to the pound. And if you look at what Putin's doing with the, the ruble and doing the other currencies, so now I even something along the lines of 65 rubles for, to the pound. Aye, so it's he, half, he, half his wage, he, essentially. He, yeah. he's, up to his half, he's got to live in the accommodations he's got in Scotland, but he's got to send his money back home. So I think now we are even bringing his family home, uh, bringing his family over to Scotland, they're going to be living with the sterling. Yeah. So it's going to make life a little bit easier for him. He's going to rent his house out in Russia. So it's extenuating circumstances that sometimes in the stands that the fans don't quite understand. So I think we're going to see a refocused diving in yeah. the next two to three weeks when he gets his kids and his family over here and his wife. I've got big, big, huge, huge aspirations for Shamal. I think Shamal, Shamal over the next four to six weeks still going to be part of a learning curve. I yeah. think it's funny because it, people under underestimate how hard it is to adapt to top flight football. Yeah. Remember where we are recruiting and the wages that we can pay. You can only recruit a certain type of player that's generally a player that's coming to the end of his career, that's had that good career, or a young boy you're trying to develop into being a top professional at your football club. Yeah. So there's going to be a development curve with Shamal, but 
I, I'm fairly confident that it's a position that I'm not going to be recruiting for in the near future, i.e. looking for a number one in the summer. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. I think he's going to make the number one jersey his own. He's going to definitely put Max and Ivan under pressure. But I think Jamal will come in and he'll make that jersey his own. Yeah, and it, it speaks volumes of where the club's gone as well. Four-year deal being given, obviously paying a fee for him as well. So it just shows you how far the club's come over the last few years as well, doesn't it? Ah, I think, um, well, this is probably the first year we've not really had to spend a huge amount of money on the infrastructure. Every other year, it's been 200 to £250,000 on up, upgrading the stadium in yeah. some shape, way or form. And I'm not saying that's what we paid for Shamal, it wasn't. But there was a wee bit of money there where I could potentially go and spend that on bringing Shamal in. And I'll be honest, Getting Shamal over the four years allows us to pay for that contract over the four years. Right. So it's not like a huge, a huge outlay at this point in time. Shamal's took a wee bit of a hat in his wages. I'll be honest with you, the agent actually didn't take any agent fees to help get this deal over the line. Right. But okay. getting paid over four years. Whether Shamal's at Livingston or not, it's Livingston, the deal's getting paid over the next four years, which really helps a club our size. Yeah, sounds like a good bit of business and hopefully it lives up to the the hype as well, but the, the squad managed to get away to Spain. You've not been able to do that the last couple of years due to COVID, David. It must have been quite good, especially with a few new guys in the building as well. Yeah, it was good. It was good. It was a wee bit disappointing for a, for a, a game point. If you normally when we get away, we have two games and had a good, decent opposition. We played some top Ajax, John before, Vita yeah. Sarnan, Anderlecht. We played some top, top teams and that kind of prepares you for coming back to the Betfred. Got let down a wee bit this year with the organisation of it and we found out really late on in the trip that we never had games while we were struggling to get these two games. We eventually got a game the last day of the camp and it was against a Murphy Select and it wasn't great to be fair and I think personally I need to take responsibility for that. Um, we came back a wee bit undercooked if I'm honest. I think we were trying to find our feet in the Betfred games but I think <laughs> There's a couple of huge decisions that went against us. You look at Maxi sending off. I'm not saying it's a sending off, I'm not saying off, but it's a, a red card decision. You're down to 10 men, then you look at Ismail as well. So yeah. there's t- <laughs> two, two games where there was two big moments in the games that were pivotal. So I think we came into the games a wee bit pivotal. But it was, it was good to get away with the boys. Very, very good to get these new boys integrated into the squad. And I think it, it fast tracks that process. That yeah. bonding process, that the relationships that you're trying to build within the change room, that gets fast tracked by going away to Spain for five, five to seven days. Yeah, it sounded like a, a good trip. And as you say, players need to live in their pockets for a few yeah. days. As you say, it integrates on that a little bit quicker. But we have managed to secure a last 16 spot yeah. in the League Cup. What have you made of the performances in the games? And you think the, the team are ready going into the League campaign? First one, Albion Rovers, I think we're in easy street then we give two goals away. Two two slack goals, but we probably gave them away in the previous friendlies as well. Hence why I've been out looking for a few players in this window, to be honest. So we, we get away for Albion Rovers 3-2, but we dominate the vast majority of the game. So I think, go to take the positives, we score three goals, negatives are two goals against, but we come away with three points and we go into the uh, the Inverness game and I think obviously Max getting sent off doesn't help I think we dominated large spe- uh, spells of that game as well with 11 and 10 men um, we give away a slack first goal because we've been good possession we've dominated most of the game up to that point yeah. um, and then we get a man sent off as well and it kind of kills that a wee bit it kills everything you're trying to do and then with the we hope he misses a penalty, he make it to each, but could have a massive impact in being seeded or unseeded. Yeah. So you lose you lose any points you had a chance of gaining there anyway. And then the boys go and we get a man sent off early doors in the Cove game. Um, but I think fair play to the players. They went and dug themselves at a massive hole. And I think they were they performed honestly, they should be really, really proud of themselves. The desire, the intensity, the energy, and their um going picking up three points with 10 men after playing the game with 70 minutes. And then obviously we go into Saturday's game where again, the King we dominated large spells of the game. And in most of these games, you've been playing against a low block and I think it's difficult at times playing against a low block. 
we, yeah. we do that against the bigger clubs and they've came here and struggled. We had Celtic Platt last year and we played a low block, do you know what I mean? And Celtic struggled to break us down. So that's kind of what we've had to contend with. I think Saturday onwards, you're going to see games probably being a wee bit more open, a wee bit more counter-attack from both teams opposed to one team sitting in and uh, the other team dominating possession. As you mentioned there, it was basically teams doing a bit what we do to other teams and you, you wouldn't expect anything else from lower league opposition, would you, in, in that scenario? so. Uh, but we kick off the league campaign at home to Rangers on Saturday. Uh, couldn't get much tougher than that, Davey. I, I know you think the, the fixture robot at the SPFL seems to have it in for us each season, yeah. but it's a big test for the players, isn't it? Oh, huge test, huge test. I think Rangers are coming into this and one of the best shapes they've been in since they returned to the Premier League. Yep. Huge confidence, huge momentum. £30 million in player sales. They've brought players in. They've been really, really unlucky in a Europa Cup final, won the Scottish Cup. So I think you're seeing a different animal coming to Livingston this time round, if I'm honest. But then you look at it, it's three out of five. We've faced the old firm away, eh, old firm in the opening league fixture, which... We must be really, really unlucky. We must be really, really unlucky. You look at it first year in the Premier League. I called it straight after the party for this whole game. I said, we'll be Celtic away. Celtic win the league, Parkhead, bang, there you go. Flag, 60,000 fans going crazy. Um, I can't remember where we were the second year, third, third year. St. Mirren, wasn't it? St. Mirren, St. Mirren away. away. And then last year, Rangers at Ibrox, they just won the league. 55,000 fans going crazy in this year, Rangers at home. So, <laughs> I, I want to have a wee word with this fixture generator. <laughs> but how are you feeling ahead of the season, Davey? And what are the ambitions going into the campaign for the squad? I probably know what any fan wants to hear, but I want to finish minimum 10 from the Premier League. I think if you look at us over the last four years previously in the Premier League, we've got the best pounds per points record by a country mile. Yeah. And what I mean by that is the points picked up with the divided by the budget or divide that into the budget budget, and we have got by far the best points per uh, pounds record in the Premier League the last four years. Do I think we've got enough in this building to go and try and push for top six? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Would I be surprised if we get in the top six? No, I wouldn't. Would I be surprised if we finish 10th? No, I wouldn't. I think it's going to be a long, difficult season and it's really, really hard to predict. One, especially when you've got the lowest budget in the league and you know you've got the lowest budget in the league. It's very, very difficult to then go and predict where you are going to finish. But I think I would see success as 10th. But again, knowing the group of players and staff I've got at the club, I think we've got it well within our reach to go and do better than that. I think probably the continuity with the squad might yeah, help out with that as well because you don't have that transition that you had at the start yeah. of last season as well, eh? Just put me under a bit of pressure now. <laughs> I see you this year, you always slaughter me the first nine games, aren't you? I'm not going really to go on social media. <laughs> Who does continuity? <laughs> nah, nah, listen, let's be honest, I think you're right. I think you're right. Continuity should help us out. It's no, it's not a given. You've still got to go out and earn the right to win that game of football. But um, I think continuity should help us this year. Davey... Thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us. I know you're very busy yeah. today. You're in the building all day, but it goes without saying, we all wish you the best of luck. Thanks very and much. the players and the staff at the club for the season ahead. Thanks. Listen, if you want to do it a wee bit more often, more than willing to come on. Make sure I've won a couple of games, but right first. <laughs> yeah. we'll, get, we'll get some open questions after a run of three defeats <laughs> on the bounce. <laughs> uh, I've got a sore throat after games. Oh, yeah. I'm only Listen, honestly, you're welcome anytime. I mean that. Perfect. Thank Bye. you, Davey. Cheers, lads. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Livingston, oh Livingston, the 
Do that.